Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. I'm Jamie, Jamie Everwin. Um, I'm the head of experimentation at Code. And I'm going to talk today in the, what is the final, I think, um, product fundamentals or product love uh, episode on measurement and optimization. So I just want to start introducing you in case there are people new here, not familiar or haven't seen these before. Just a quick intro to us at Code. Um, we're a digital experience design and build business. So the, it's a mouthful, but it, essentially it means that we work with clients to um, understand their customers and their customers' needs. And then we design digital experiences for those customers and the clients um, to solve the, I guess, the problems that we've identified and the opportunities. Um, and then we build those things. We build those experiences for clients. So it could take the form of building apps we've done in the past, uh, often building websites, sometimes kind of one-off um, little build projects like microsites, things like that. Um, I'm going to whiz through some boring house rules. So I think everyone's joined on mute, which is, it's cool. Um, if you have any questions, I've got Teams open, Yayan's got Teams open, Yayan's um, in marketing here at Code, he's got Teams open as well. And at the end, I'm trying to reserve about 15 minutes just to flick through the questions. I've suggested if it's relevant to a slide, just pop in slide X um, and then whatever the question is. And then if I can, I'll, I'll flick back to the slide. Uh, and then the talk is also on YouTube. so. If you have anything that you want to review post session, it'll be up on YouTube, along with all of our other talks uh, in the product love set. Um, and yeah, stay muted until we're talking about questions just to avoid feedback and stuff. But you are welcome to show your lovely faces if you want, but don't feel obliged to. So a um, little bit about me. So these are some of the clients I've worked on here at Code. Um, they're really broad. Uh, I love it. Like this is one of my favorite aspects of my job. I get so such a broad range of clients. Um, I've got approximately eight years experience in um, product optimization, experimentation. I've got a sort of like a weird mixed background. I actually started as a social media manager, but I often would look at data. I got I learned Google Analytics, um, did a lot of A/B testing, became a CRO manager, and then I came to code. And it kind of broadened me from a CRO manager. And I learned um, much more about qualitative user research. Uh, we have a lab in the office for usability testing. Um, I learned about product thinking. And it helped me to apply that CRO mentality to other things. And that's why um, I've, I've sort of eventually ended up as head of experimentation. Uh, and I work with our product teams to embed experimentation into everything we do for our clients. Um, and then I also work in what we call our performance studio, which is where we do very focused experimentation. So more like classic CRO programs. Um, and yet, like I said, this is my introduction to product measurement and optimization. The final one in our product love series. Um, and again, for anyone new to the series, the idea was to give everyone um, or give you an overview of uh, product thinking um, and some of the practices that we employ here and just share some of the ways that we work and the things we've discovered and, and you know, share some of our experience. And like I said, youtube.com slash code computer love. This talk will be available at the end and all of our other talks are available. So I'm going to whiz through because I'm going to try and Keep it to within half an hour. It's broken up into six sections, but there's kind of two overarching sections, which is leading with measurement and then into optimization. And I'm going to start with why we measure, and I'm going to talk through some strategies for, for measuring and how to develop a measurement strategy, then embedding it um, into your teams and into your business. And then on experimentation, again, why? Why we experiment? how it helps us um, make better decisions, and then just share a bit of our process. You know, we've got some nice diagrams, some clearly defined processes I want to talk through. So starting with uh, product measurement and why we measure. So I, 
I can summarize this, I guess, in one picture. Um, and I love doing this, just one picture. I think it's really good. I think it summarizes it nicely. We measure to avoid waste. Um, we measure to know that what we're doing is valuable. And that, that word value is at the heart of everything we do. We're always trying to make something valuable for the client, for the customer. And when we measure, we can see, ah, okay, that thing, that change we did actually didn't have our intended outcome. Um, or this advertising, it's not bringing in customers as effectively as, as this other piece of advertising. So we want to avoid waste, wasting time, wasting money and wasting other resources. And it's not a new problem. It's not a new thing. It's not a new phenomenon. This is um, John Wanamaker. He was, he's, he's one of those people who's considered to be a, a pioneer in marketing. He founded one of the first US department stores and he was talking about this, this problem essentially a long, long time ago about not knowing whether he's spending money in the right places. So I just, I think I wanted to highlight here that measurement is, I mean, it's not new, it's not digital. A lot of things that we do digitally are actually old things that we've done for a long time. And we're just bringing them into a different format. Um, and then lastly, and this is really important for me because I've been an analyst, but I don't think analytics is just for analysts. Um, I think good measurement and good analytics is for, really it's for every stakeholder uh, and every decision maker. And it helps people, it helps you, it helps people in your business to make better decisions. Um, you know, if you're an advertiser, it's obvious it helps you to focus your money in the right place, your budget um, to get the best customers. If you're a, a developer, it can help you to understand that that thing that you built is as fast as it can be on the website. So developers will often try and measure site speed and everyone knows about site speed. You know, you've got Google focused on core web vitals. For me, measurement is, is that change that I'm making on the site effective. So while an analyst can help me get that information, um, actually the, the information itself is useful for so many different people. So next up, I just wanna go through a bit of measurement strategy um, and just talk about some tools that you can use to help you build a strategy and define your measurement and what to measure. So you can think of this in uh, two ways. Um, you can measure outcomes, and that is you've made a change, you've done a campaign, and you want to see if that particular campaign or that particular change did what it was intended to do. This is a one-off. You know, you might perform a single analysis piece. You might ask someone to perform an analysis piece for you, look at it, and then hopefully you would take that and you'd potentially iterate on whatever you did. Um, but you can also measure ongoing performance and particularly with a product or with a website. Uh, this tells you on a over time basis um, how well that thing is doing at whatever you want it to do. So how well is our website selling products to customers or um, generating leads, for example? And the difference here is that obviously it's ongoing. You might have a dashboard. You wouldn't necessarily have a single report. You might have a dashboard. You may have um, weekly reports or monthly reports that are either automated or people make but you can use this to look for opportunities and look for trends rather than outcomes as an individual piece of work that you're analyzing so i want to talk a bit about um, the process of measurement and actually really it doesn't end in measurement it ends in hopefully optimization so good measurement starts with a good strategy. Um, it starts with a good definition of what is important to you, what is important to your department or your business, or I guess your business function. Um, and therefore, what should you measure? And I've got a few methods of uh, trying to help you define that coming up. And then you work through configuration. Um, this is where you'd almost definitely need support. You'd need analysts, you might need devs, depending on where you're configuring. It might be measuring the website. You might need developers to help you build something to the website. Um, it might be a database and configuring your databases to be able to share information with you. This is so important though, because if you get the configuration wrong, obviously all the measurement you do will be affected. Um, good configuration 
especially if you get it right, but also you can measure things that you might not anticipate you need now, but you've got them there, you can measure them when you need them, can make a huge difference. I've been in a lot of conversations where people have said, oh, it would be interesting to know how many people clicked that component and I quickly go in, quickly go on the website, check Google Analytics, and I have to say, oh, I'm really sorry, whoever set this analytics up for you, they didn't measure that component. So then we have to add it, and then we have to wait, and it might be waiting months before the data is available and there's enough of it. Um, so a good configuration will set you up on the right path for the rest of your measurement. And then you would perform your analyses. Uh, so in your outcomes focused measurement, this would be a one-off piece of analysis, would be a report. Um, in your ongoing, this would be building uh, a dashboard, putting together all the metrics for that. Um, and then the result of that, the result of your analysis is how you visualize it. And again, this, this can be so important. So there can absolutely be small ad hoc things, a basic report, just some numbers, but you can, the visualization of metrics can be incredibly powerful and it can completely change the way it's received. I've given data to people and I'll give it to one person as just a table and another person almost as a story. You know, it might be through PowerPoint, it might, be, might even be through a video or something like that. And it can absolutely 100% change the way they receive it and it can change people's minds. Um, and sometimes the analysis and visualization, you can get a lot of mileage from bringing together different forms of analysis. So, in the past, we've had examples with clients where we've been talking about things on a web page and we said, oh, not many people who interact with this component ever complete their journey on it. We think that there's something wrong with the component. And they've, the clients recognized it and they said, oh, yes, yes, OK, yes, we should do something. But it's never been prioritized. When we've combined it, for example, with usability testing in the lab and showing the data plus a video of somebody struggling with the component, that completely changed the way the client perceived that information and suddenly that got the priority it deserved that the data alone couldn't quite get across them it wasn't quite emotional enough for them um, so great visualization can absolutely change the way people receive your data and your story and finally and, and i think the most important part is optimization or, or potentially just action so there are two aspects to this. You may be looping and optimizing your measurement, um, and that, that is absolutely fine and very important. So you may go back to your strategy and think, well, we measured this, we pulled out this metric. Actually, it's not particularly useful, not as useful as we expected. So let's stop measuring that. But this metric over here, we think we should look at that. But this is also about doing something with the measurement. So one of the worst ways you can measure is you produce a report send it to someone or a group of people, they have a look at it and then it ends. Um, and you know, I've, I've seen people and I've been there and wasted time doing this and it's, uh, it's just really difficult. Whereas when you send someone something and then something happens, it's so rewarding. And it means that all the measurement work you put in has value and then can continue to have value. So absolutely, this is 100% the most important part of this. Make sure that that measurement is valuable, take action on it. So I said I would talk a bit through the strategy. Um, we use something called a measurement framework for this. You may be familiar, um, but it may be a new term. I've got a few examples. There's some great Googling. I'll, I'll give a suggested Google phrase in a second. But um, the goal of this, the, the idea of a framework is this helps you break down your business objectives all the way down into things that you can measure and individual metrics that you can then put on a dashboard. And the idea is you might have a business objective and you break it down into several different things and you break them down and you break everything down further until you're measuring metrics that you agree with your peers contribute to that business objective. So I'm just going to whiz through a couple of examples. So one, a very a, a classic one, really easy to use is a goal tree. It literally breaks it down. So you start maybe a business objective is revenue. You can have multiple, um, so you wouldn't necessarily just have one. But say you have revenue, you break that down into, OK, that's visitors to the website 
and revenue per visitor make up our overall revenue. Um, then you can break visitors down. Well, that is retention from the previous month plus new acquisition from this month. And then you can start to measure those. Um, you can break down revenue per visitor. So that's average order value and conversion rate. And you can go even further. So you can end up measuring, right, what's our average quantity and what's our average unit value? This is useful just to help you in stages break down your objectives into measurable units. Um, there are also pirate metrics. I like this one. If anyone's brave enough to come on mute, off mute and have a guess at why they're called pirate metrics, please be my guest. Um, this breaks it down into more of a flow. So starting with your acquisition of a customer, activation might be um, getting them to sign up as a lead or getting them to purchase. Retention is then obviously keeping them. Referral is that customer making more customers. And then all of that results in more revenue. They are pirate metrics because they spell A-A-R-R-R -R -R or R. This is a framework proposed by Google and used by Google, actually, which breaks it down into happiness, engagement, adoption, retention, and task success. But my favorite thing about this framework is that then it, it cross-references that against goals, signals, and metrics. There is a lot of reading on this. There's a lot on the internet about this. If you just Google heart measurement framework, Google have done actually a paper that explains this. I've tried to give a, a really simple example. So say your engagement goal is for customers to use your app more. The signals are identifiers that you think suggest that that is happening. So that's longer app sessions and more frequent visits. And then the metrics are the actual things that you can measure. So average session length increases, that's longer sessions. Returning user percentage means people are being more frequent. Um, you may have another goal, which is growth, and then you wouldn't look at necessarily returning users, but total users, for example, or just new users. This is a good one that this, you absolutely should read further on this. Um, quick Google of heart, well, heart measurement. And yeah, there's a lot of reading. It's really good. Um, one of my favorites, if not my favorite, um, is actually overlaying it on a customer experience map. So again, and I, I've, I've done a little suggestion. Literally, if you Google customer experience map template on Google Images, there are so many examples, so many great examples. But the idea, if anyone unfamiliar, is um, customer experience map is like a big flow of first interaction with your brand to final interaction. And when we measure, we put the measures of where people drop off and where we acquire people and put the actual figures onto this map. I love it because it gives that information in a contextual way and it puts it with other information about the customer, like what they liked, what they disliked, you know, their experience and how they feel. Just whizzing through this because I'm absolutely burning through time. So a good metric should be strategically relevant. That's to your business goals. Easy to use and understand. Imagine your report is going to be shared. Uh, you know, it might be shared with the board. It might be shared with people who've never seen it before. Um, comparable, especially across time, but also different business units. But time is so useful because you can see then if you're progressing and whether you're getting better or worse. Timely, so you should be able to pull that metric now, relevant to now rather than relevant six months ago. Ratios rather than counts. So um, saying 10,000 people come to our site from Facebook doesn't tell as much of a story as 50% of our traffic is from Facebook. Uh, segmented, so Instead of just, we have this many users, try and break it down into, okay, this many mobile, this many tablet and desktop. And then you can take more targeted action on those metrics. And then, like I said before, absolutely lead to a positive action. Um, otherwise, it's a wasted metric. Bit of further research for you. Quick Google product measurement frameworks. The three I've talked about and lots, lots more are available. There's loads of great reading. So... Just doing a few slides on embedding measurement into your company. Um, starting off with something that is just a general product thinking um, 
mantra, which is just focus on one thing at a time. So in this case, it's one metric that matters. Instead of always trying to look at the seven important metrics to your business, focus on one for a few months and then the next and then the next. It just helps people work through and gives them a clear focus. Um, use meetings and routines. Don't just send out reports and hope people read them, but try and schedule something, go through them with people and share what you've learned. Make lovely dashboards. This is one of my favorites. It is quite busy, but it was so useful. And then embed these dashboards if you can. So obviously we're not physically here, but in our office we have screens at the end of the tables and we used to put these dashboards up at the end and a few teams have started coming back in and they've started putting their dashboards on again. And it's great because every day people can look at the stats and see how they're, how they're doing. And then finally have retros. Um, if you're unfamiliar with retros, a quick Google of retrospectives, you will get a lot of product thinking retrospectives. And the idea is you reflect on what you've done and you can do this with your measurement. Think of it as a cycle, focus on the metrics that matter, get rid of the ones that don't. So it's measurement covered. I'm gonna whiz through some product optimization now. Starting with why, why we experiment. And I'm gonna do it through a journey. Um, one of my favorite stories, I worked on this. I worked on Mag and loved them as a client. Mag operate Manchester, Stansted and East Midlands airports. They have a lot of traffic um, and they make a lot of money through parking. And this is the site they came to us with. And they had told us, they said, you know, parking is a primary thing for us. Um, we want to focus on it, but also offer everything that our customers need. So we did research, we went away and we redesigned and everyone was so confident. Everyone thought this is lovely, looks neater, prioritizes parking, makes it easier to book. It's got some selling points there and it's got some clear options afterwards. And we A-B tested it and we're all super confident and we knew it was going to win. And it didn't. And actually it dropped parking sales by nearly 8%. Now this would cost a heck of a lot of money if we'd gone live with this. So if we hadn't run this as an A-B test and had just gone with this, and there were people saying we should do that because everyone was super confident, we, would have, we wouldn't have seen this until maybe a month later or maybe a few weeks later when Mag said, oh my God, we've lost a lot of parking sales. But we did, we experimented, we learned, and we went back to it and we redesigned it. We brought some, we tried to put some trust in with the um, payment methods, brought some iconography in, we tried to clear up the parking options. We ran it as an experiment again. And we got nearly a 5% increase in parking sales this time. And actually that was worth, according to MAG, they did this um, estimate for us, almost, well, just over, half a million in incremental revenue on an average estimate based on their seasonality of parking. Now, if you think that was a 5% increase, then the 8% loss would have been huge. Um, and that in a nutshell is why we experiment because it helps you to isolate all those different factors and it helps you to confirm that something has actually had the intended impact. So just a few bits on um, making better decisions through experimentation, um, but also through insight. So I imagine everyone's familiar with this. Um, I've, I've definitely done a few of these things and I've been in meetings where people have, have you know, done some panic actions and things like that. These are the kind of decision-making processes that we know we shouldn't be doing. And we know that you know, if you always did this, it results in failure. And actually the better decision-making process is insight driven. You know, it's using research, it's using analytics, it's tracking what people do, it's experimenting. Um, and it's not new, it's absolutely not new. All the big companies doing this. This is from Ben, Gome, ben Gomez um, in 2008 when he was at Google and he was an engineer. And he was talking about how they run up to 200 experiments at any given time. Um, and, you know, I often reflect on Amazon and think, I don't think I've ever seen the whole Amazon website change in one go. It's always a little bit. It's always, I'm lucky if I'm noticing, oh, that, that menu feels like it's slightly different. I'm sure it wasn't like that last week. And they'll be testing constantly. And that is how they build the website. So finally, I want to share a little bit about our optimization process. Um, so I think it could help. So we start with objectives. This is 
extremely important. This is like the strategy of measurement, essentially. We need to know what we're trying to achieve for a business. Then we research users and look at our users achieving those objectives for the business. What do the users want? What the data is telling us? We might bring in some UX experts and ask them to review the layout of the site, the usability. We write hypotheses based on our evidence. We've got a template for this. I'm going to show you that in a second. We will design new things, new changes, build them, and then run them as an A-B test or an experiment. And then finally, and this is so important, we learn from it. I don't think of any A-B test as winning or losing. Um, it's all about learning. This had a positive impact. This had a negative. We should, you know, if something had a negative impact, you've just learned something not to do in the future. You can share that knowledge with other people. And then we iterate, we go back, we reflect on the objectives, and it's a constant cycle. This is the template we use for our hypotheses. It starts with evidence, then you describe your change, and then you talk about the effect you think it will have on users. This is there is a distinction between that and the measurement. So I would make a banner bigger if I think people aren't seeing it and therefore aren't aware of, for example, our guarantee. The effect is that I think more people will see the banner, be aware of the guarantee, and then feel more confident in buying from us. Then the measurement is my purchase rate increases. Um, a good hypothesis doesn't say this insight, this change, conversion rate will increase. It's specific. It's what conversion rate do you expect to increase and why? Then we prioritize our hypo hypotheses. There are a few, there are lots, so many different methods. I've got a few listed here. My favorite two are effort and impact because it's so simple. You make a grid, effort on one axis, impact on another, and you start prioritizing things relative to each other. So the hypotheses are all relative to each other and you focus on your low effort and high impact and then your higher effort, but high impact. Um, my other favorite is impact, confidence and ease. It's very simple, but you can put it in a nice table. You can give scores and then you can calculate a priority score. It's a little bit more detailed because it gives you your confidence score, which is essentially how confident are you based on the evidence. Again, further research, if you want, just have a look for product prioritization frameworks in Google. There are so many. There are some great articles as well. Um, if I remember right, there's a UX design dot CC article that lists the ones I've mentioned and a few more, and it's really useful. And then obviously with our hypotheses, we'd start to run experiments. So I've got a few um, golden rules. Usually people aim for a minimum of 300 conversions. Um, it just generally gives you enough for most experiments. It can vary a lot. It can vary on your baseline conversion rate and on the size of the change and how much traffic, but 300 is sort of a good finger in the air ballpark. Um, you want to run them for at least two business cycles. Now, for most businesses, that's probably a week, just a natural cycle. But if you're a business, for example, that operates on a specific monthly cycle, then you'd probably run for two months. This is just to rule out things like you might have been doing something in one cycle that you're not in another. And then you always aim for statistical significance. Um, there are different types. So there's frequentist and Bayesian. There is a lot of research, a lot of reading. I still, after years of reading and reading and reading, can't fully get my head around it and need some of our data scientists to help. Um, but there are tools to help you calculate this as well. And this, this I cannot stress enough, build a knowledge base because what you really don't want is to run an experiment, conclude it, and then lose that information. You want to keep it. And sometimes knowledge base can help you running your experiments. Um, so a whole program of experiments, you can run through the right tool. This particular tool is Airtable. It's very good. There is also one called Notion. Um, Notion's a bit more versatile as a knowledge base. Airtable is very much a very configurable table. Think uh, Excel on steroids and on the web. Um, Excel's very, uh, Airtable, sorry, is very useful for just running through those hypotheses and marking where each one is. Notion is good for capturing a bit more knowledge. You can write into it like Word. Um, you know, you can write full hypotheses in it. Uh, both have a free plan, so you can try them out, and I absolutely suggest you do. And then you might tackle 
uh, you might run into this question from some people. Well, do we need to run it? Let's just do it. You know, we're confident. I, I said that it came up with that mag example of the home page. I would say to that, how much of your own money would you bet on it? Because that changes the way people think. If it's just the business money and you think, oh, well, it might have a 0.5% increase. If you say, well, actually, that costs this business £10,000 a month, would you bet £10,000 of your own money? Suddenly people are thinking, oh, well, maybe not. It is the best way to isolate your change from other factors. Um, we've launched things in the past where a client has said, no, no, we just want to launch it. And then the client has switched on brand TV advertising. So for a week, the thing looked like it was really good. That new homepage was great. And then suddenly the conversion rates tanked and everyone was running around and the client said, oh yeah, by the way, we switched on brand TV advertising, which naturally drops your conversion rates. Uh, that would have been isolated in an A-B test and that would have been equally split then between the changes. And then what success rate? So um, this is my last point. You, people have different views. Qubit say they have a, a, about a 5% success rate. Um, Booking.com say about one in 10, but actually they talk about it as every experiment is a success because they are learning. If you want to have a look at it, there's a great Harvard Business Review article, look up building a culture of experimentation on Google. The great article in HBR, and it talks about how Booking.com and other companies have this culture of experimentation. Um, so what I want to leave you with on that is think of two different types of experiment. Validation is where you think X is better. You've done some research, you've designed a new page, and you just think it's better. That can win or lose. And it's very difficult to learn something from that other than X is not better. Exploration is where you will experiment maybe three different things. You might try A, H, and Z deliberately at opposite ends of the alphabet because you might try a heavily wordy version of the page versus a heavily image focused versus something in the middle. And then with the result, one will win, one will be the best, but you will learn that actually the wordy version is much, much worse and the image version is much, much better. And you've learned something about your site and then you can improve and you can iterate. So try not to always validate, try to explore a bit more. Um, and here's some, some great reading. My favorite is the Lean Startup. It's got some great stories, um, really nice explanation or really nice demo of what an MVP is or can be uh, from Dropbox. Um, but yeah, some great books here. Lean Analytics is another good one. Our analytics team, absolutely love that one. And that is it. Six minutes later than I intended. So I'm gonna whiz through uh, and just see if anyone's got any questions in the teams. There has been a few, Jamie, if you want to um, we'll check awesome. into those. <clears throat> so starting with Kieran, what methods do you use to populate customer experience map, user research, depth interviews? Yes, user research and depth interviews. Um, you may use uh, usability testing in the lab, maybe interviews. Um, it can be surveys as well. And then that experience map we were just showing you, we would combine that with analytics as well. So we'd look at, for acquisition, how we acquire customers for the website, how they flow through the website, where they drop off. Um, is it possible to use more than one measurement framework at a time? What's the best way? Absolutely. Yes, it is. Um, so think of a measurement framework as good for a particular type of measurement and a sort of a particular type of business. So it might be that you're in marketing and your measurement framework is focused on that acquisition journey and then activating. So Google's is very much the active activation, for example. Uh, sorry, not Google's, the pirate ones. Um, but then there are other measurement frameworks that might be more focused on the user experience. Again, that I'm, I'm sure it was UXDesigns.cc had some great frameworks that were for different purposes and you absolutely can you can use a different one for these sort of micro measurements but ultimately you do want to try and link them to your business goals and make sure that what you're measuring and therefore what we're trying to improve ladders up to those business goals 
Um, who else needs to be involved with the PM while thinking or making a decision on a product manager while thinking or making a decision on which framework to use, either for measurement? So I would suggest as many stakeholders as you can get um, because, you know, we've done this in the past and maybe haven't included devs because people tend not to think of the devs for the measurement. But they might say, well, site speed is hugely important. And for site speed, you need to measure these things specifically. Um, you obviously would like an analyst. Um, if it's focused on acquisition, you want your acquisition teams. If it's focused on usability and user experience, you might want your UX teams. Um, that again is similar to the measurement framework question. Think about which framework you want to use and what thing you're trying to measure and then try and focus on that. Um, Kate, do you have any advice for testing where the main product is not a web based user interface, the CG services APIs? Yeah, this is a an age old Internet age old problem. So apps, for example, um, there are tools that can test. So I know Firebase allows you to test. Um, there are there will be some tools, but I haven't used any that will be able to test in the app, but actually in an app, for example, you need your developer support. Services and APIs. So we actually do a lot of tests. I'm a big fan of not just defaulting to a front end testing tool that um, you know rewrites your website. I work with our developers and try and switch the testing to back end. So in the past, I've built tests myself using um, oh, it's really nerdy and technical, but there's a there's a, a sort of a caching software that helps to speed up websites. And one of the things that it can do is just randomly split between two different backends. For example, it might split between two APIs and you can test in that. So for that question, you can talk to your devs, uh, particularly your backend devs. I guess the best answer I can give is think of the logic of a test. You need to randomly split between X variations and you need to maintain the split. As long as you can do that and then report on it, measure it, you can do the test. So as long as you can somehow record that this is the same person, this is Jamie, Jamie visited two days ago and I gave him this version. I'm not going to randomly split him. I'm going to give him this version again and you can do the initial split. Then you can test different services and different APIs in the back end in that way. There are also service side tools. So Qubit support service side. Uh, AB Tasty have a server side offering. Um, it's a great tool, Sites, which is like a hybrid server-side client side. So you, it downloads your website from your server, then you go in and say rewrite this content, um, which might be used this different service or this different API, right? and then it sends it to the customer. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just pop those names into the chat so you've got them. So yeah, there are options, definitely options. A, B, A, C. Server side, no problem, Kate. Um, site spec. Okay, I think that's all the questions. Awesome. Three minutes. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, and I hope you found it useful. And look me up, email me. Um, I didn't put my LinkedIn, uh, but it's J Everwin on LinkedIn. I'll pop it in the chat as well. So if you want to ask anything else, uh, I'm around and always happy to help. As Jamie said as well, all our previous um, talks are, are on YouTube if you, you want to catch up on, on the other sessions. Um, and we do host these monthly as well. So um, yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll see you again in another one. And we are, of course, on social. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, right. Just paste my LinkedIn and then thank you very much, guys.